All right guys, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we're gonna talk about what it's like saving somebody's life and running a Code Blue. Let's get into it. Now, Code Blue means that there is a medical emergency and that the patient is or has decompensated. Now, this can be that the patient's not responding and or that you can't feel the pulse, and the nurse in that room will go ahead and press a button and let everyone in the hospital know this patient needs help. That's where doctors like me will go ahead and stop what we're doing and run to go help that patient. So in today's video, we're gonna talk about what happens during a code, what it's like running a code. I'm gonna actually put you in my own shoes and most importantly, what happens afterwards. So first, let's talk about what goes into a code. Now, most people think that as a doctor, your whole job is to save lives, but unfortunately, most of our day-to-day -day activities are spent on things that are a little bit more mundane, whether that's writing notes, putting in orders, or just reviewing labs. But when you hear a code blue on the intercom, everything stops. And so let's start from start to finish, actually what goes into a code in the first place. And when the code is called, one of the first things that will happen is that the nurses will start chest compressions and CPR. In a short amount of time, an anesthesia team in the hospital will be running to the patient's room really for one goal, and that's to support their breathing, and often that means intubating them. And while I'm making my way over to the room as the nurses are doing chest compressions and anesthesia team is taking care of the airway, there are gonna be other groups of nurses that will also get ready for the most important medications that I will likely be ordering. And finally, there'll be a team of doctors and nurses and essentially technical staff that will be waiting around for my orders for anything that I may need, whether it be labs, blood, medications to be given, or for somebody to get in line for chest compressions. In a matter of just seconds to minutes, strangers across the hospital will be at this patient's bedside for just one goal, and that's to save their life. Next, let's talk about what it's like being the doctor who's running the code. And I want you to imagine yourself in my shoes as you're running to the patient's room and you hear that code blue on the intercom. And as you go ahead and shuffle yourself through the crowd into the room, you run into what looks like functional chaos. There's just people everywhere, things everywhere, chest compressions happening, and it's your job to get it all under control. And so the first thing you'll be doing as you walk into the patient's room is to go at the front or the head of the patient's bed, put your hands, behind your back and declare that you will be running the code and will be the leader from there on. As the doctor, the most important thing for you to do is to delegate and make sure that things are happening appropriately because so you can't be involved in the nitty gritty, which is why we put our hands behind our back. Now, by the time that you are running to the patient's rooms, things have already started to happen. And so you wanna make sure that you catch up with all the roles of who is in the room and what exactly they'll be doing. Now, one of the first things you'll be doing is assigning a timekeeper. Now, this person will likely be keeping timer on their phone as well as writing down what medications have been given and at what doses. Now this person is probably one of the most important individuals in the room because they can shout out when it's time to go ahead and check for the patient's pulse, which we do for every two minutes, as well as when it's time to give another medication like epinephrine. And so if this person hasn't been assigned, it's your job to point at somebody and saying, you will be my timekeeper and make sure that they acknowledge that that is now their new role. Once you have your timekeeper, next you're gonna focus on who will be in charge of administering and drawing your medications. This will likely be two individuals, one who will be ready to draw whatever medication you ask for, and one who's ready to give it at moment's notice. Now, once you have these roles identified, the next thing is to talk about the access that you have to your patient, particularly IVs. Now, most patients usually in the hospital will have one IV in one of their arms. It's important for you to have at least two, just in case one of them fails, you have another one that you can give those life-saving medications to. Now, if you can't get a good IV for your patients, other things you can quickly do is to put an IV through their large jugular vein, that's called a central line, or actually do something that's called intraosseous access, which is basically what you drill through somebody's bone in their legs and quickly give medication through there. Now, once you have your roles and your access defined, the next thing to make sure is that there are people ready to do chest compressions on your patient. You don't want one person to be doing it longer than two minutes at a time because they're likely gonna get tired if they're doing it correctly and you want that patient to have the best chest compressions every single time. Now, for everyone else, they need to give you space. So you wanna make sure as a leader, remember, hands behind your back, make sure the room is clear except the most vital team members. So moving on, now that your tasks are delegated, it's time to actually get to work. Now, all doctors are certified in something called ACLS or Advanced Cardiovascular Life Support. Basically, this is a more advanced version of CPR where we're not only are we trained on how to do chest compressions properly, but also what medications and when to give them. And luckily for doctors, this is very algorithmic. So if you see a patient with a pulse or not a pulse or their EKG looks like it has a certain type of rhythm, you go down a different pathway in terms of what medications you give at what doses. Now, the first medication you're likely to order that every patient during a code will get is epinephrine. Its entire job is to 
to both make sure the heart starts to work and increases the heart rate, as well as constricts those blood vessels to make sure that enough pressure is getting to the most vital organ, particularly the brain. Now during this time, you have individuals doing chest compressions and you do it at the making of this video for two minutes at a time. Now because you've assigned somebody to keep track of time, they will shout out to the entire team pulse check. Now at this time, everyone will stop what they're doing, including chest compressions, and try to feel for a pulse from the patient. Now if you don't feel a pulse, the process is pretty simple. You're essentially going to do the process all over again, and during your next pulse check, you hope that the patient has a heartbeat. Now during this process of going through multiple cycles of chest compressions and epinephrines and other medications, you also want to keep in the back of your head why that patient's heart stopped in the first place. That means you want to check the most basic things, including electrolytes, blood count, sugars, and other things as well. Now obviously it's going to take a little bit of time for you to get those results back, and so you may start prophylactically giving medications to increase or decrease certain numbers, like your electrolytes, or giving somebody sugar if you notice that their glucose is low, or giving somebody blood if you think that they're bleeding. And so during this code, you're super alert. The algorithm is really second nature and you really have one goal. That's to get that patient's heart rate back. And so hopefully during one of your pulse checks, you'll realize that that patient actually has their pulse back. And if this is the case, you immediately try to stabilize the patient, which means hooking them up to a ventilator, making sure they're on appropriate medications to keep their blood pressures up and quickly wheel them to the ICU. And in other situations, you run into instances where a patient's pulse just doesn't seem to be coming back. But every patient deserves a chance. And so you as a doctor is to continue to do chest compressions and CPR for as much as it's appropriate for that patient and try to give them a chance. So as you guys can see, running a code has various emotions coming into it. In your mind, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of hope, there's a lot of just nervousness of hoping this patient makes it. Oftentimes, you as a doctor may be running a code on a patient, you have no idea of what their story is, what their history is, or why they're in the hospital in the first place. But immediately as you walk into that room and start that code, you feel some sense of personal responsibility. In addition, sometimes you may have family members who were in the room the moment that patient's heart rate stopped and are now yelling in the hallway, again, your main job is to stay focused. And so during the codes that I've run, I realized that the most important lesson is to walk into the room check your own pulse first and take a deep breath. Now next I wanna talk about what happens after a code. Now if you're able to get a patient's pulse back, unfortunately they're not out of danger. Like I mentioned, you're gonna take them to the ICU as quickly as possible, but many patients may have their heart stop during the process of transitioning or when they're in their ICU themselves, they may have their heart stop multiple times. But hopefully by this time you have some of that initial information back, including their basic labs, as well as imaging, x-rays, things that you can start acting upon. And so while in the ICU, the doctors include myself so will try to do their best to stabilize them and keep them out of harm's way. But the most important question you're probably asking at this point is how do these patients actually do? And the truth of the matter is many of them, not so great. The act of actually having to do chest compressions on somebody means that there is a moment of time that blood is not going to the brain. And so even if you're able to get a pulse back, sometimes these patients don't always recover the cognitive and neural function they once had before. A lot of times you may have somebody who you get the pulse back the first time, but then their heart stops again. And unfortunately, the second time you're not able to revive them. And for the patients who do recover of their heart rate, many of them do have long-standing consequences of not getting blood to their brain for some period of time. And even for the patients who you are able to bring back, only about 10% are actually able to be discharged from the hospital. And many of these patients may have a repeat cardiac arrest while in the ICU. And unfortunately, you have to remember that during CPR, there's a good amount of time that blood is not going from the heart to the brain. And so many of these patients may have some long-standing functional and neurological decline. So even if they are in that 10% that are able to be discharged, unfortunately, many of them don't get to go directly home. Some of them and many of them actually have to go to long-term facilities and physical therapy centers and nursing homes. So as you guys can see, the process of running a code is something that every doctor hates because that means that we're taking care of somebody that's severely sick. But it is a skill that we all need to know to provide that final bit of medical support and hope. And for all the codes that I run myself, I remember all of them because they have their own unique challenges. I always walk out of the room learning more and hoping that I can use that lesson to help the next patient that I have to serve. But that is a broad overview of what it's like running a code and trying to save somebody's life in their final moment. Hopefully this video and this episode was able to give you a little bit of insight. If you did enjoy this video and you want more content like this, first of all, Go ahead and hit that like button to one. Let me know that you guys want more content like this. Drop your comments and questions down below in the comment section down below. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. And in case you guys are interested, go ahead and check out this video to see how long it took me to become a doctor and this video to see how much doctors make in the United States. But thank you guys as always for watching this video. Thank you so much for being a part of my journey. Hopefully I've been a little help to you on yours. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.